Hello, everyone, and welcome back this week to the PFF Wisdom of Solomon podcast with young Anthony Tresh. First of all, Anthony, before we get started, because we've got a lot to cover. Um, how was your weekend? It was pretty good. How was yours? Pretty good. Did you get in any good trouble? Uh, not bad trouble. See, as a young person, you got to go out, you got to experience the nightlife, and you got to get into some good trouble and de develop some stories to tell everyone. Any, any of that you can tell us about? No, nah, it was pretty pretty laid back weekend. Watched yeah. some good college football. That's one of the good. best games I could remember. So you're always but, yeah. pouring through the data, right? That's yeah. what you do around here. Tell yeah. tell us more about what you do. Yeah, addicted to the game, but it, it's a good addiction, you know. Addicted <laughs> to football. That's right. But yeah, just diving into the data and making up some graphics here and there and creating some content. That's, uh, what, that's, that's good, cool and is. you're very good at it. And we want all the young people to know that young Anthony Trash. He's only 20 years old. But he, he loves football. He's passionate about it, passionate about data analytics. That's what we do here at PFF. So if you're young and you're passionate about football and you're passionate about the data, you too can land your dream job and come work with us right here at PFF. Right, Anthony? Exactly. That's right. Just take some hard work. All right. So let's get into it because our first segment of the day, we're going to talk about Lamar Jackson, the quarterback of the Baltimore Ravens. Um, and I know when he first came in, I was like, I don't think he can last. I don't think he can last. I keep waiting for the bubble to burst. And it was after the Seattle game earlier this season. I said, I, I, you know what? This kid is playing at a level that I have not quite seen. Michael Vick never rose to this kind of level, even though he had the same similar kind of talent. What I mean by that is for a guy who's got the quickness and the agility and ability, he can still throw it. But he improved his accuracy coming into the 2019 season. That's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. One other thing that I'm seeing that really frightens me for NFL defenses, he's making plays within the pocket. Last year he was good outside the pocket at times, but he certainly would get out and make plays with his legs. But now if you're forcing to play from inside the pocket, he's proven that he can carve you up. Absolutely. And I kind of went back because over the past offseason, I remember John Harbaugh kind of talking about how he's going to change this offense a little bit. Yeah. So I went back and I found a really good quote that he said to The Athletic back in July. Mm -hmm. He said, I expect this to change the way offensive football is played in the National Football League. Wow. Not that everybody's going to take on the style, but I expect us to create something that has never been seen before. And I think we're going to be in more elements than any team has ever been. Oh, and, that's that's prophetic. It, that's being a prophet right there. Exactly, and that's exactly <laughs> what they're doing. I mean, yeah. what we saw from Lamar Jackson this past week, and, I mean, it was insane against oh, the Bengals. It was the second highest graded game we've ever seen from a quarterback. Ever I mean, since we started grading games exactly. here at PFF. Back in 2006. Wow. I mean, think about the thousands of games been played. He had the second best game ever at 97 points. So that would be the highest graded game by a quarterback so far in the 2019 season. Correct, yeah. Yeah, the only game that ever topped it was last season was Russell Wilson, who's looking like the MVP this year. Of course, yeah, right. He, he, he had a 98.0 last season against the Lions. That was pretty good. But, um, yeah, right now he is our second highest graded quarterback wow. at 88. .0. See, I'm glad you mentioned Russell Wilson because I think when Seattle took Russell Wilson in 2012, I've watched him. Remember, as a rookie, he, he led that team, right? They were winning. Then next thing you know, they win a Super Bowl. Next thing you know, they go back to another Super Bowl, end up losing to Tom Brady in the final seconds. But he has been the most prolific. He now has the most fourth quarter come from behind wins of any quarterback since he's come into the league in 2012. But I think Russell Wilson sort of began to change people's minds because that's how we get a Patrick Mahomes. That's how we get a Kyler Murray. People say, I want one of those. And you see Coach Harbaugh saying, you know what, let's take a shot. Everyone else had Lamar Jackson being some receiver in the NFL, but he, he saw something special. And by teaming him up with Greg Roman, the offensive coordinator who is prone to do things that maybe only college teams would do, right? Triple option, mm -hmm. the pistol offense, and build it around him, maybe like he did with Colin Kaepernick back in San Francisco. What do you see in terms of what Greg Roman and Lamar Jackson, what do they bring together that's giving us something special and unique? Yeah, I mean, rushing goes. I mean, we know he's been outstanding in that regard. But what yeah. they're what they're doing with Lamar is that they're avoiding cornerbacks, really, the opposing cornerbacks, and that's really how they beat the Patriots. They avoided their elite secondary, and they went after the yeah, linebackers. That's right. That's exactly what they've been doing. And, you know, you look at who he's been targeting, and he's targeting – 
you know, non-wide receivers 15% more this season than he did last season. Yeah. So he's avoiding his wide receivers and in turn avoiding the cornerbacks. So he's really trying to pick apart these linebackers and he's been successful in doing that. And then when we dive back to last season, when we look at his non-wide receiver targets, so he's going after those linebackers. He was our fifth highest graded quarterback despite his accuracy. Isn't that something? Season. He still was connecting enough for big time plays. Exactly. And that was last season. And this season, he's still around the same grade. Yeah. And you, you look at that wide receiver unit, and it's granted, it's still not the best, but you have to love Marquise Hollywood Brown. I mean, yeah. this guy. I, th I think he's going to be something special. But this is why they went out and got him. They knew they were going to be running RPOs, play action passes, and when you draw the secondary up to the line of scrimmage, they knew that the speed of Hollywood Brown could attack that kind of defense when they're running their RPOs and play action pass game. For sure. And then we saw that, you know, going back those first couple of weeks. That's right. Where, you know, the opening. Big time throws. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, his opening, his rookie debut, uh, Marquise Brown's, that is. It was insane against the Dolphins. I mean, it just looked like every time he was on the field, he was getting open. He was getting mm -hmm. separation just right. exploding off the line of scrimmage. And he's been hurt the last few weeks, so they've really had to get creative in the way, you know, using their wide receivers. Mm -hmm. But then he's starting to come back, and we saw that last week kind of come out. Lamar Jackson, uh, just to kind of add some credence to the data that you're giving us, he is the only quarterback this season to have a perfect quarterback passer rating in two games so far this season. Most people can't do that in one game in a season. He's already done it in two of their ten games. What, how, in what way does the system help him to be a better passer? Because they're known for running the ball. You look at all of our data, they run it um, is probably as much as any team in the NFL. They certainly run the ball over 50%, I think close to that. Um, they're doing just about everything in the running game, and it's helping their ability to throw the ball. Yeah, and – when you look at their offense as a whole, I mean, they're, they're really efficient rushing the ball with the running back, not just with That's Lamar. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're, right now, they're the only team to generate positive EPA per play. So basically, just measures efficiency on a per play basis. That's right. With the running back, mm -hmm. you know, rushing the ball. That's pretty good, too. Exactly. I mean, they're better off running the ball, handing it off to a running back than 19 <laughs> teams are passing the ball. Wow. So, you know, when we wow. talk about the run game doesn't really matter, when you look at the Ravens, they're making it matter. It's, it's so in that way, uh, John Harbaugh's right. They're changing the game. Because we at PFF, we believe points come in the passing game. All the data suggests that you're going to get be more productive as an offense throwing the football with good quarterbacks, not bad quarterbacks. So you're going to be more. But this goes against a lot of those data points. Oh, definitely. And, you know, his accuracy has improved. It's not just, you know, Greg Roman and John Harbaugh, you know, kind of, he, it's not like this was stuck in him and they're bringing it out. That's he right. has improved mm -hmm. from a passing yeah. perspective. And you can see that when you look at his numbers, throwing past the sticks. Yeah. You know, back in 2018, he had a 58.3 PFF grade yep. on those passes, just seven big-time throws and that eight turnover-worthy plays. And then you look at this season, his passing grade jumps up to an elite 91.3 on those plays. Phenomenal. It 15 big-time throws to just three turnover-worthy plays and then is averaging more than two more yards per attempt on yeah. these. So what he's doing, you know, from an accuracy perspective, you know, is pretty, it's pretty unremarkable. He, uh, against the Bengals, his 13.1 yards per pass attempt was the best of any quarterback in Week 10. And so he's, throw, he's not just dinking and dunking. That's why I bring that number up. What you're learning is that he's pushing the ball down the field, but he's doing it accurately. And on Sunday, didn't take any sacks in that game. So that's remarkable. That's how you're going to get – the kind of grade that we gave them, um, the four big-time throws, the touchdown passes, but zero turnover-worthy plays. He didn't fumble it, nor did he throw an interception, nor did he throw a ball that could have been intercepted. Phenomenal. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's the best of both worlds when you have a guy like Lamar because if your offensive line isn't the best, you know, if you have an average offensive line, this guy can escape. He can escape from the pocket, and he's good, you know, scrambling. But this offensive line is currently our highest graded in PFF grade and giving him the lowest pressure rate. Yeah. So, I mean, when you have those two combined, I mean, it's really, it's almost unstoppable, you have to think. Yeah. You know? it's, we, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult to contain. And then going back to that whole wide receiver, you know, he's targeting non-wide receivers a significant amount. Mm -hmm. The tight ends exactly. is what you're talking about. Yeah, more tight ends, more running backs as yep. well. Mark mm -hmm. Ingram's getting his fair share yep. in the passing game. But right now they have three tight ends ranking in the top 12 in PFF grade. Wow. I mean, that's, that's unheard of. That's unheard of. That's right. Because you, you're lucky if you have one good tight end like a George Kittle or a Gronk or Travis, Travis Kelsey. 
No team has three great tight ends. You just can't stack them that way. So what we're seeing is some tight ends that might be just average guys really performing above maybe the expectation of what we expect to get from some of these tight ends. But within this system, with uh, Lamar Jackson at quarterback, we're seeing tremendous production out of just average tight ends. I hate to call them average, but that's, to be honest, that's what the data says. Yeah, basically. And, you know, Mark Andrews, I mean, that, that this guy's good. Yeah, he's good. No, he's, there's he's, no, he's, he's good really good. Yeah, he's one of but our. But the other guys? Players. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you got Boyle and Hayden Hurst in there. Boyle has improved, though. I'll yeah, give him credit. Have. I'll give him credit. They have improved, but, you know, their production has been good, but you have to think it's mostly because of the way they're using them. You know, Absolutely. It's the system at hand. And you can kind of see that within the PFF. Group. So now we got to ask this question. Is his playing style, is it here to stay? And can he survive? I mean, I look at that spin move he put on the Cincinnati Bengals, and I'm thinking you only get one of those in this league. You only get maybe one or two. And as quarterbacks age, remember, there are no aging running quarterbacks in the NFL. In the 100-year history of our league, as you begin to age and you're going to play that style, remember Cam Newton is a much bigger man than Lamar Jackson. He's 6'6", 250. And now we see him at a point in his career where not just age, but all the pounding of running and being physical and doing so. Sooner or later, those athletes on the defensive side, they catch up with you. And holding onto that football is like holding a loaded hand grenade. The longer you hold it, bad things happen. Defenses get to hit you. So if he continues his playing style, one would say maybe the career isn't long, but I think I'm seeing him develop because I mentioned earlier his ability to make accurate throws from within the pocket says that he's just going to continue to develop and grow and evolve. What do you say? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, it is kind of – you kind of have to wonder that as well. You know, is this going to – is he going to be able to stay healthy, you know, risk? Is this sustainable? Risking, exactly. You know, because we haven't really seen this before. Because right now he has 38 more designed rushing attempts than any other quarterback. There you so go. That's, taking that's a out, lot. Taking out scrambles, yep. all those pass plays. When he gets the ball, he's taking off and running. And he's been great on those right now. I mean, he, yeah, he 5.3 yards. Right per now, carry. they can't even pull his flag, let alone tackle him. Like if we were playing flag football. <laughs> right. But you know, as we get older and quarterbacks, eventually you're going to take a shot. I mean, I want to see him stick around, and I liken him to a Michael Vick who never really developed that pocket presence to be able to make plays from the pocket when teams tried to muddle rush him and keep him contained. But I also compare him to Steve Young. Steve Young was a quarterback that he was a runner, and then he developed because he played behind a guy by the name of Joe Montana, and he learned how to do it. And Steve talks about this, that if you're willing to do the work and you can evolve to that, now you become an even a more unstoppable weapon as teams begin to want to take that away from you and you prove that you could do it, now there's nothing that they can take away from you. Right, and, you know, it's looking like he's not going to follow the TB12 method and play until he's 40. <laughs> that's that's a, for sure. There you go. But, right. you know, you, you think, you know, that for 10 years, do you think you can get enough out of him? I mean, you've, oh, played, yeah. you've played in the NFL. Do you think this is sustainable, you know, for the— I, the, I, the, I do. Sure. If, he, if, he, if he starts to make more plays from the pocket, which this year he's shown us that he can do. I mean, he did it to the Patriots. The Patriots tried—Bill Belichick tried to keep him in the pocket, did not want him to escape and extend plays. And he proved he can make those throws. He proved that he could do it. Now, if you could do it against the Patriots, I think you can do it against anyway. Did it against the Seattle Seahawks defense on the road up in the great Northwest. But he's got to continue to evolve in that way, continue to improve in that area. And that, if he can do that, I believe he is not only sustainable, I think he answers the prophecy that John Harbaugh predicted, that he's going to do something unlike we've ever seen before. Uh, that's well put. I mean, yeah, that's well put. Coming from in, a former NFL player, too. Keep yeah, in mind. thank you. Yeah, and you also, we, we'd be remiss not to mention, you know, John Harbaugh, he's one of the best, you know, decision makers that's in right. the NFL. That's right, good point, Anthony. You know, our data, yeah. data scientists, you know, really uncovered this, that his fourth down decision making is really unmatched, and that's really kind of putting Lamar Jackson in a good spot. I think they're hitting, what, on 77%, close to almost 80%. On their fourth down plays, they go for it on fourth down as much, if not more, than any team in the NFL. And they're converting at a much higher level than they convert on third down. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I just think that's because of the talent 
uh, of Lamar Jackson. They believe in him that much. He has the ability to come through. And I think defenses, when they get you in third and long and then they get a stop, they start to celebrate thinking that they're coming off the field and here comes the putting team. And no, Harbaugh says, no, stay out there. You're going to have to stop us one more time. Right. And defenses are proving that they're unable to do it. All right, let's transition to a topic that I know um, is something that you've been working on because the Oakland Raiders, as of late, have begun to kind of catch our eye. They've begun to kind of pay off a lot of the moves made last year. You might say they were tanking in 2018 as they traded away Khalil Mack, traded away Amari Cooper, trying to get draft picks, and people wondered if they could harvest those picks and yield good talent and yield wins. People thought that they were playing for the 2020 season when they'll be kicking off next season in Las Vegas. But it looks like Coach, uh, it looks like the Coach Gruden and what they're doing out there, we're going to ask the question, can they make the playoffs in 2019? You know, right now it's looking like they very well could make the playoffs. Wow. And, and I was looking through the schedules, and I think we're going to get a really good matchup here in a few weeks. So right now the Raiders are sitting at 5-4. and four. Okay. Yeah. The Chiefs at 6-4. and four. Mm -hmm. And the Raiders, these next two weeks, they have the Cincinnati Bengals and the New York Jets. Okay. And the I, way the Raiders— They could knock some wins there. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, there's no guarantees in the National Football League, but you have to think these are the best yeah. the best chances for it. That's you know, right. It's pretty locked in. So that there. means they could be sitting there at 7-4, and four, right? Exactly. After 11 games. And then you look at the Kansas City Chiefs, and then they'll have the Chargers next week, and then they'll have a bye. So we're saying best-case scenario for them, if they win, they sit at 7-4, and four, and then those two face off then next week. So they could be tied going into that game, 7-4, and four, and here comes Oakland, here comes the Chiefs. One team, let, if I dare say, is trending up. And even if they check in, the Chiefs check in at 7-4 and four with a win and then a bye, went over the Chargers and then a bye, that defense is not impressive at all. One might say they're trending down. Patrick Mahomes throws for over 400 yards in their game against the Titans in Week 10, and still it wasn't enough to get the win. Exactly. I mean, that Chiefs defense is looking like a liability out there on the field and you know mm -hmm. we were talking the other day and Patrick Mahomes he can win games but he can't win them all can't win them all he, he not by himself help. right exactly can't win them all all by himself and tell really me more about the Raiders though because when I here's what I see when I look at the Raiders and then you could tell me if the if the data supports what I'm seeing I, I'm seeing a team that the quarterback in terms of how they're using him highly efficient throws very short I don't know what the average depth of target is, so I know you're going to tell me that. But Derek Carr is, if not leading the league in completion percentage, he's near the top right there with Russell Wilson. And they're using Josh Jacobs to just carve up defenses. He forces as many missed tackles as any running back in the National Football League. And so between the quick, um, efficient passing game of Derek Carr and the real wonderful, brutal <laughs> running of Josh Jacob, I call it brutal because this guy just shreds tacklers. Between those two combinations, they're playing really good offense, and surprisingly, the defense is making plays on the back end in their secondary. Exactly, and Derek Carr, I mean, he is executing this John Gruden West Coast offense to perfection. Awesome, good I mean, to hear. It is, I mean, it's been flawless, you have to think. What is he doing? So right now, he does have the third lowest average depth of target at 7.0 yards. <laughs> so that's right. Deacon and Duncan, right? He's exactly. not pushing it down the field. No, but when he is pushing it down the field, I mean, he's been lights out. Okay. He's really, defenses don't know when to expect that. Uh, that's right, because they've given you a steady dose of the short game. Exactly, yeah. because, you know, this West Coast offense thrives off of these short chunk passes. That's just right. Move the chains. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've seen a lot of big plays. You're just seeing a lot of good small plays that are leading up to success. Mm -hmm. And on throws of 10-plus yards, Derek Carr is our second-highest-graded quarterback wow. right now. That's he's great. He's fifth in pass rating and ninth in adjusting completion percentage on those throws. So it's, he's not just a system quarterback, as a lot of people like to say. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, he's, when he has the opportunity, he's going to take it. Okay. And as a result, he's our fifth-highest-graded quarterback. So in this moment. way, you might say John Gruden is grooming Derek Carr to be what Rich Gannon was, he can be an MVP. He can be a guy that controls the tempo of the game. But when it's time to strike, we all know Derek Carr's got tremendous arm talent. When he first came in, I mean, this guy was a long ball thrower. But you might say that John is sort of harnessing all the talents, turning him into a more disciplined quarterback, a more patient quarterback, 
that can go up tempo if you need to, that can slow it down if you have to, and that you can just control clock even yet with the passing game. And I'm glad you mentioned his patience because he, yeah. he's been great when he's, you know, when he's under duress and there's really not a lot out there yeah. and he kind of has to create and give some time. He's been phenomenal. I mean, that's he, wonderful. He, he's currently our second highest graded quarterback when under pressure. You know, he's first in adjusted completion percentage by over 8%. Oh, that's pretty good. On those yeah. plays that's in second awesome. passer rating. So he's really just been, he's been, you know, patient, as you said. Mm -hmm. And granted, this is a volatile metric just because you see different types of pressure. Yeah. So you kind of, it's, it's measured a little weirdly and you don't see, it's not as predictive as clean pockets. Except, that's right. But you can see when a quarterback has poise and he's showing that. Yeah. Um, if, if there is pressure and yet you're still operating at a high level, that's always good. And you're right, sometimes there are some anomalies because if your check down guy isn't there or if you do check it down and they don't make the catch, and there, are, there are a lot of things that can happen, a lot of variables. But the fact that he's playing good in a, in a clean pocket and under pressure, that bodes well for him. Tell me about Josh Jacobs. What is he doing for this offense that maybe other runners just aren't able to do? Because I watched them against – Melvin Gordon played good. Melvin Gordon had 100 yards, but for some reason, he doesn't impact his offense the way that Josh Jacobs impacts the Raiders' offense. Yeah, and when you're kind of looking into the PFF database and seeing how good Josh Jacobs has been, he's been one, our highest graded running back. I mean, he's been he's been Of great. any running back in the NFL it, in 2019. He's, he's been great rushing the ball. Yeah. You know, he has been granted. It's not as efficient as the Ravens' okay. rushing attack. That's right. But they are sixth in EPA per rush attempt. Okay. But they're still in the negative in that category. Yeah. So it's not as impactful as one may think. But, you know, he's been doing per very well behind a, the run blocking on the offensive line has been – it's been so-so. It's been average. But gotcha. the pass blocking has been pretty good. Mm -hmm. So when he's contacted behind a line of scrimmage, he is making plays. I mean, he's a wow. elusive guy breaking tackles left and right. And that's really how we go about grading – running backs at PFF, it really is about the elusive rating, the ability to make people miss. Exactly. And really what kind of interest means of Josh Jacobs when I'm going back and watching him mm -hmm. is that when this guy is running at or between the guards and just running up the middle, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a bulldozer. I know. I mean, he just he trusts people. He shreds you. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, like you said, you kind of – you are better off passing, but when you – you know, the NFL teams are not – some are, you know, analytically inclined. You know, That's they're not right. going to pass the ball, you know, like 80% of the no, time, 90% no. of the time. You're, they are going to rush the ball. Mm -hmm. And so when you are going to rush the ball that much, you want a running back like Josh Jacobs. And why is that, mainly? Yeah, just his, his elusive threat. I mean, gotcha. he, you know, what he's doing behind a so-so offensive line in the situation he is in from a rushing perspective, he's doing a lot with nothing. And he, he is a rookie. I have him uh, down for the most – Miss uh, force missed tackles um, of any running back in the NFL at 46. Is that is that data correct? Yeah, I mean, yeah, he is okay. the most elusive That's running right. back from a uh, missed tackles force yep. per attempt perspective. He's still not leading that category. Okay, um, off the top of my head, I, I believe the last I checked it was Alvin Kamara, but he's still top three in that metric as yeah, far as that. Absolutely, and, and like Alvin said, Kamara is great been... at making people miss in space. Exactly. And so. Um, Here's the thing. I look at the receivers, and I don't see any of any of the top receivers. Like, if you look at the top receivers in the league, I don't see them playing for the Raiders. I know at the tight end position they've improved, but everything else is just so-so around the quarterback. Um, why is this offense good enough to help them possibly get to the playoffs? If they're going to make it, this offense is going to have to continue to play the way they have. I'm not saying they got to um, be marketably better. But what are you seeing in terms of why this offense is is good without these receivers being highly prolific? Yeah, and it goes back to that West Coast offense, just mm -hmm. because they're not, you know, they're not they don't have to get separation, you know, twenty yards downfield, fifteen yeah. yards downfield. They just have to get, you know, make a play within five to ten yards of the line of scrimmage. And then you, you mentioned the tight end, you know, Darren Waller. He's been phenomenal. Yeah, he's good. He's and, really good. You know, I very think, athletic. I don't like to even call him a tight end because he, <laughs> with his feet, you almost have to that consider him true. a wide receiver. That is true. That's right. And he's he's a very versatile guy. Right now, he's our sixth highest graded tight end, and he can play anywhere in line, slot, or out wide. But, I mean, most productive receiver for the Oakland Raiders. Absolutely. Clearly, Derek Carr's favorite guy. Oh yeah. Clearly, sure. the guy that gets open more than anybody else. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I believe he ran a forty time around the. In, 4-4, four, four, yes, somewhere did. around yes, there. Yes, he did. I Absolutely. Mean, this, this guy is yeah. a tight end. His speed is unmatched at that yeah. position. 
And when he is in line, it's just something teams don't really see a lot when you have that speed. Right now, he's first in yards per route run when he's lined up in line on the line of scrimmage and second in PFF grade. So here are the Raiders' final seven games. Because you mentioned the next two. They've got um, Cincinnati at home, and then they travel cross country to play the Jets. I don't want to say that could be a trap game, only because of the travel from West Coast all the way out East. And the Jets every now and then surprise you. Either way, they surprise you and win a game they shouldn't, and then they surprise you by losing a game to someone like the Miami Dolphins, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Okay, but beyond that, at Kansas City, so they still have a date with the Chiefs. They've got Tennessee at home. They've got Jacksonville at home. Then they've got the Chargers again, and then at Denver. So they finish up the season, their final two games, on the road within the division. That's not easy to close out on the road, your final two games, on the road within the division against division opponents. But those are their final seven games. You're saying that they've got just as good a shot as the Chiefs do. Because I, Denver, I don't think they're going to be there. I know um, the Chargers are kind of knocking at the door, but they just beat the Chargers. I think they're a better team than the Chargers. But this it probably won't be a wild card team coming out of this division. You're going to have to win it in order to get in. Yeah, and, you know, the only thing that really kind of worries me about the Oakland Raiders is that defense, just because yeah. when they're playing a good quarterback, I mean, they're getting lit up. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's been, it's been you know, it's either been really high or really low when it comes to who the they're Thursday playing. The Thursday night game, though, I thought they gave Phillip Rivers all he could handle. I think there were a couple of picks that were called back. <laughs> and it wasn't had nothing to do with the defender. Um, but, I, you know, Phillip Rivers is a very good quarterback. Now, it was on a short week. I was surprised by the Raiders in their secondary. But, boy, were they making some plays. Oh, yeah. I mean, that Thursday night game, that was by far, I mean, far and away, the best performance from okay. a defensive perspective this okay. season. Mm -hmm. And that's including all the So, was it an outlier, you think? <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, when you're looking through it, their three worst games from a coverage standpoint was against Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, and Kirk Cousins. There you go. So, I mean, they've been... Like I said, when they're playing a good quarterback, mm -hmm. it's been kind of they've shaky. Been, they've been carved up. Exactly. But when they're playing guys like uh, Jacoby Brissett, okay. you know, and then they play Chase Daniel, and they, they lit those guys up Absolutely. Know, from a coverage perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's the only part that kind of worries me. And then going back to their schedule, I mean, looking at the quarterbacks they're facing, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Ryan Finley, yeah. Sam uh, Darnold, which uh, you have to like those matchups. You've you, got to love those matchups. Exactly. That's right. Then you'll have Patrick Mahomes, which – you know, we're, that's going to be an interesting game as that'll we're be, talking that'll about. That'll be a good one, yeah. And then Ryan Tannehill, Nick Foles may be a dangerous problem, but Phillip Rivers, that offense has kind of been declining, you have to think, and same with yeah. Phillip Rivers. I mean, he's he is getting up there, you know, in age, and then you close out the year with either Drew Locke or Brandon Allen with the Broncos. So you have to think, you know, can they produce, you know, can they afford to win you know, five of these? Yeah, I, I think they can. I mean, well, it's going to be tough. I mean, they're going to have to – surprise us a little bit. I think for me, the true test is going to be that week 13 game on the road at Kansas City um, after playing the Bengals and the Jets. Because going to Kansas City is never easy for the Raiders, especially against Patrick Mahomes. But by then, that team could be riding a certain high, a certain confidence after feasting on the Bengals, going out to New York if they were able to beat the Jets. I think they're going to come into that game feeling good about themselves. And even for themselves, I think it'll be a test as to where they really are as a, as a club, as an organization. So I think that's going to be the game that we're going to look to and say, okay, Raiders, who are you? And if they can go in there and come out with a win, I think they're going to come out of that game with us having a different perception of them than we currently do. Yeah, and you know, going back to that Chiefs game they played back in Week 2 when they mm -hmm. lost, I mean, that was Derek Carr's worst game. Yeah, you know, I, of the season. I recall. That, I mean, the entire offense, it was pretty yeah. bad from a pass-blocking perspective, too. And Mahomes lit them up. And exactly. <laughs> he lit that yeah, secondary he, I mean, up. he lit them up. But, you know, we didn't mention earlier, you know, this offensive line. We have to give credit to that yeah. offensive line. They've been performing fairly well, you know. Right now, they're allowing the third lowest pressure rate in 2019 compared to 25th in 2018. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now they, they just got Gabe Jackson back recently, and he's been very well these last four games. And you look at these, you know, four of the five offensive linemen ranks in the top seven at their position and pass block rate at this moment. So you've done a lot of homework on this. So I got to I gotta get you to weigh in. Because young Anthony Trash, I'm telling you right now, this guy's got a great mind. He's got um, great hold on the data, great understanding. You think the Raiders get in? 
I think they do. You think I, they, right you, now, I think you're they leaning do. towards them getting in? Yep, 10 and 6. Okay, all right. All you heard here. it right here right for here. young Anthony Trash. All right, right now we're going to step aside. It's time now for our one on one interview with Merrill Hodge. Time now to welcome Merrill Hodge to the podcast. Of course, Merrill, a former eight year NFL veteran, a running back who played with the Pittsburgh Steelers and Chicago Bears, spent 20 years or more covering the NFL with ESPN. And when he's not in a deer stand hunting, that's right, he's still covering the National Football League. And first, Merrill, let's get started by talking about those Pittsburgh Steelers. They have now won four in a row. They're in second place inside of the division. And if the playoffs were to start today, the Pittsburgh Steelers would be in. And that's without Ben Roethlisberger. Just give us your impression of how your former team is doing currently. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually, it's been a, I think it's a, a product of a couple of things, Solly. I mean, this is to me where leadership and great coaching is critical. And um, you have to have put that on display first. You got to give guys a plan. You got to create a plan. You usually have to scratch the plan you had before. Hence, the guys that you just mentioned, uh, especially Ben not being there. I mean, that just completely changes, transforms what you got to do offensively. Um, defensively, they have been. Uh, I'll tell you this: in the training camp, I was like, "Now that defense is going to be uh, special." I just they they have so many parts. So they were young, but. I just felt that they have a chance to be really special. Obviously, not anticipating Ben goes down, but and then, you know, players responded. You know, like a lot of young players, I I think maybe fans know that, but it's not just Mason Rudolph. I mean, you know, you look at their receiving core. Oftentimes, they're running backs because everybody's been banged up. You know, they had a lot of young, a lot of a lot of new learning in across the board, and so for them to have dug themselves out of the hole and actually be in a position where you kind of control your own destiny. Um, I, I don't think there's many people that thought that would be possible for them once they started out 0-3. Oh, there's no doubt. They started out 0-3, and, and now with uh, Mason Rudolph as the starting quarterback, he's now 3-1 and one as a starter. So just kind of talk to me about what you have seen from him because I'm seeing a guy who it kind of started off a little shaky. He took the hit, had to sit out a game. And even when he came back in the Monday night game against Miami, that game didn't start off well, but he persevered. He has seemed to develop and grow with every single snap, every single quarter, every single game. And now this guy is kind of starting to make big plays, throwing the ball down the field. Yeah, you know, Sally, you know, he was – Here's what's kind of fascinating to me or interesting is that um, I, I love how people want him to develop. You know, you, you're going from a guy who played nearly two decades, a future Hall of Famer, won Super Bowls, uh, and this kid's played like three games. And they're like, why are you throwing a ball down the field? He needs to throw a ball down the field. <laughs> now, if you go back and you look at his development in the – in the scope of what he's played, all right? There's five or six games that you can evaluate and look at, and you're clearly no position in the history of sports has ever developed to six games. So have that perspective. But if you look at his first couple games, he, you know, listen, I remember his first play against San Francisco. They dialed up uh, absolute perfect play based on the coverage they thought they were going to get, and it was – different route combination. Um, in fact, I had the tight end wide open. And I'm going to tell you what, Mason didn't even look at it. He couldn't wait to check it down. Now, everybody who's ever played, Solly, I'll put you you in these shoes. Everybody who's ever played their first snap, I mean, is <laughs> really, things getting go blurry. You know, and you're like, I just don't want to mess up. I mean, this, you know, you, you don't have the experience. Anyway, he misses it, okay? Um, now, later in the game, he actually comes back to it and just overthrows it. So, let's see, the first couple of games, people were acting like they were, he was just checking it down and that's all they were doing, which was incorrect. They were designing things down the field. He just wasn't taking their, taking shots down the field or taking advantage of it. Now, he started to do that later. It kind of came out of his shell against Cincinnati, actually, on the Monday night game. Um, he hit the big one where they actually busted the coverage. Um, he missed one other that he probably could have taken a shot at, but what you got to look at overall in the national football league, it isn't like everybody hits bombs all day long. I mean, you hope you calculate three or four shots that you, and that you, you hope you win 50% of them. No team goes in. I, hope, I mean, you hope you get them all, but no team no, thinks we'll get all these. So, you know, when you start watching him on tape, I'm like, A, he started to open up. And the thing that's has probably impressed me the most 
is his ability, his composure in the pocket, his willingness to stand in there and take a shot. Um, the only area that he has to really get better at, even though that's a, it's a great characteristic to have because it's going to help you develop, is when you do do that, you got to take care of the football. You know, you can't fumble um, if you take the shot. You know, it's not about his interceptions. It's like you, you just can't turn the ball over no matter what. So, um, it, it, listen, there's more positives about him at this point yep. than there are negatives. And, and so I think that's what people have to really look at. And um, he gets better every week. I haven't watched him on tape in the last game. So I can't tell you, you know, that game was somewhere where he grew or, or, or he didn't grow. But up to that point, you know, there's a lot more good solid than bad on him. He did a good job of taking care of the ball week 10 at home against the LA Rams. He did take the sack maybe holding it a little bit too long, standing in his own end zone. But you're right, he did not fumble it. He did protect the ball. And tell me about this Pittsburgh Steelers defense. They had four more takeaways in the game against the L.A. Rams. And what about Minka Fitzpatrick? Since he's come over, he's been sort of that final chess piece for what you talked about was a young secondary. He's a playmaker. Five interceptions in the seven games he's played with Pittsburgh. And now this defense has the second most takeaways of any defense in the NFL just behind the New England Patriots. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it, so it really all starts off front with when you, when you look at their ability to get after the, the trash. They got two edge guys. They can get after the quarterback. You know, people, I heard somebody was talking about, boy, you got to decide who you're going to chip. I'm like, uh, no, you don't. You chip both. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm like, I One's go, not there's, enough. There's, I go, there's not, there's no nobody on, uh, I don't know a coordinator that's going, hey, listen, we're, we're good enough to just chip one of them when they're creating that much disruption. You have to take care of them. Um, and that's where you start losing offensive options. You know, you're going to keep a tight end and a back end at times to help out, or they're going to leak out late. And Cameron Hayward in the middle has been, you know, he's not known as a passer. I mean, I know you know this, but I don't know if people appreciate how complete a football player he is. That's right. Um, he is just, he's been an absolute beast. You, you can't sleep on him either. You know, so when you have to worry about three guys, if you watch, if you watch the Steelers of lately, you, you wouldn't call them Blitzburg. They just don't, they don't have they to don't pressure. They don't have to blitz, that's right. They really don't, and there's no need to do that. With the young guys you got in the back end, um, Don't let's not put pressure on them like that because we're getting enough pressure up front. Um, let's start working better together. That's what I think um, Fitzpatrick really has um, contributed. You know, obviously he has, he has great range as a player. You know, he's, he understands that position, and he has great instincts. Now, the, the pick six he had, he's – I know he was when the ball was coming to him. He's like, I can't believe he's throwing it to me because that was I know, that was not like some great play or great scheme that they had. Yeah. I'm telling you, I don't know what he was what Hoyer was thinking that because it was a cover three look right off the bat, yeah. and he threw it right to him. But just his, I think his 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 instincts of that position have made his that secondary better, um, and him being in those positions to have those interceptions is is a part of that so that back in back end now is complimenting the front end and vice versa you know which they really didn't have you know the first couple weeks pittsburgh steeler gave up a first round pick in order to get minka fitzpatrick the reason why the dolphins took the first round pick from the steelers they saw ben was out for the year they figured it was going to be a high first round pick but they forgot that um, every team that mike tomlin has coached in pittsburgh has had an eight and eight record or better He's not had a losing season. It looks like their team could be headed to the playoffs. So the Miami Dolphins may have bet wrong expecting to get a high pick um, in exchange for Mika Fitzpatrick for going to Pittsburgh. I want to turn your attention to Lamar Jackson because you and I have talked so much about quarterbacks. What works in the NFL and what doesn't? He's changing my mind, Merrill. I can tell you he's changing my mind because he's starting to make more plays from the pocket. Yes, he has the spectacular runs. He's doing some things outside of the pocket that maybe he has always done. But he has seemed to be willing, like a, maybe a Steve Young. He seems to be embracing that if you're just going to do that muddle rush and keep me in the pocket, he's embracing making plays from the pocket. It's what he did to the New England Patriots. And then he just shredded the Bengals. And now we're mentioning him as a potential MVP. So I got to ask you, 
is Lamar Jackson and the way that he plays, is he here to stay? Well, yes, as long as they're able to run the football in the manner in which they run it, Solly. You know, um, and um, that's the thing to me that give, will always give them a chance to be in every football game and win a championship. It's the thing I try to tell people, the most important thing in the National Football League, you got to control the tempo. Now, you can sit there and we can come up all the different ways you, you can control the tempo. The most consistent way, the really best way is if you run the football and you can stop the run. Now, if you have those two and those two equations and they're part of your team and you're good at that, you got your chances of winning in the National Football League go out the roof. Now, how you win championships off of those two things, can you complement it in other ways? Now, the way they go about throwing the football, I agree with you. Lamar Jackson complements that just as good as you could possibly complement it. His ability to run the football is only another added face. I mean, when you look at their way they run the football, it might be the most complex and complete in football. Even though San Francisco does some really interesting things and, and creative things, which I love. But the quarterback's not a part of that. So you would have to lean towards the Ravens. And there's just more there's more threats, more there's more phases to their running game. And when you start doing that, you now become the dictator. You know, now I don't have to worry about what coverage you're in. I know what coverage you're in. <laughs> That's right. I, I know what you got to play because you're not going to let this happen anymore. There's nothing more demoralizing to a team than when you're getting pounded on. And that that includes, I don't care if they're throwing bombs on you all day. It's not as devastating as getting pounded on. When you get pounded on, it just erodes your the other team. And I just think what Lamar Jackson has done um, – is the way he's complimented it is fantastic. If they can keep doing that, I don't think there's any doubt. I think the, the real question is, you know, if they don't have that running game and they had to traditionally throw the football on a consistent basis, I just didn't see anything in college that would lead me to believe he could do that. Yeah. And even today, I don't believe that he could do that. Now, over reps and time and learning, Solly, if you keep him in this environment and you keep developing and you add a few things and you you're allowing him to grow and learn into that because eventually he's going to have to because there's one of the biggest dudes on all the planet who's taken the toll from playing the game running is cam newton okay it's going to cost you and catch up to you eventually yep. at some point you got you can't play like that you know he can do that now but you're not going to you're not going to play a decade of football at the quarterback position by doing that. Eventually, it's going to catch up to you. So does he have enough time to kind of evolve to where, A, he doesn't have to be the threat as much anymore, and he's offsetting that with the way he throws the football. So um, I still think that's uh, a question that will be decided over time. But if they can keep playing like they're playing, heck yeah, they can win a championship. Heck yeah, it's here to stay. I just don't think they can maintain that caliber for, you know, year after year season after season eventually his ability to devastate you run the football is going to have to be swapped over into his ability to throw it and hurt you versus run it on you uh, really good stuff Merrill. I, I before we let you go i have to talk to you but i know no one loves the game of football more than you i know you've coached um, at the high school level you've coached little league you've worked with young players as, as a mentor to help groom young players in the game of football I want to talk to you about your book. It's called Brainwash, the bad science behind CTE and the plot to destroy football. Tell us more about the book and, and the purpose for why you wrote a book with that kind of title. Well, so, so I really, it, it, this is what struck me. I went on a quest really just kind of want to find out what the truth is. I have a, a philosophy in life to find a way, take action on your circumstances, um, find out all the facts before you draw a conclusion. Uh, and things I'd heard on TV and radio and the media, they clearly were not consistent with what I knew to be true about the game. Um, I didn't understand the science. I went on a quest. I talked to many neuropathologists in this country, even up in Canada. And finally, a neuropathologist, though they all kept saying the same thing to me first. They just said, Merrill, it's a finding, a, the tau finding in an observation state. We do not know the things that cause it. We have people who have the same tau pattern, never played sports, never had a history of head trauma, never had a concussion. They're like, here's what you need to do. You need to go read some scientific literature so you know for yourself. 
The first paper I was asked to read was called The Spectrum of Disease Paper, authored by Anne McKee. The conclusion of the paper, because of the methodology and really how awful the science was in it, it says you cannot give any sense of degree of CTE to professional athletes or the military. It's very clear in there because it's a garbage paper, really. But she was asked later about that research she did in the media, and she was quoted as saying, after doing the paper that I just told you, she wrote, and it's in there, you can't use this. She says, I got to believe all football players have it. Well, there can't be a more grotesque abuse of the Hippocratic Oath than that. And then I'd read more and more literature, and I'd see what they'd say in the media, and it was contradicting what the science was saying. So to make a really quick synopsis of it, I felt like if I was a parent in search of stuff, A, a lot of people don't have time to go across the country and world that look talk to neuropathologists, read the papers, and then have somebody explain it to them so they understand it correctly. I put it in a book. I, I put it in a book to help people understand all of the facts, to help empower them with what really is going on in youth sports, how much better and safer youth sports are today than in the history of our game, the actual truth of the science, the real facts behind it, so that people can make an informed decision off of all of the information, not a fraction that they're getting from the media. So that's what really really drove me to, uh, to write it, and I encourage people to read. I'm not interested in changing people's mind, but I am interested in opening up your mind with all the facts and that's what really drove me uh to write the book and um, um I, I got a neuropathologist dr cummings who helped me with the science so we could make it clear and understandable and and it's a powerful book it's really been helpful to a lot of people who have heard all of this stuff in the media and have been misled and i tell people all the time it's easier to be fooled than it is it's easier to convince people it's easier to fool people than convince them they have been fooled yeah and when you start reading all the information and the real facts you know people start to go wow i didn't know all that but then they all start applying common sense and they're like okay you're right i mean this doesn't make sense and therefore now you can make better decisions for you and your children well we thank you because i know you care about the game you care about what it can do for kids if they're playing at a younger level or through high school with the right kind of coaching and the right safety measures that they can grow up to be great leaders and great uh, participants in society. So the game does offer that. We thank you for taking the time. The book is called Brainwash the Bad Science Behind CTE and the Plot to Destroy Football. Merrill, I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast this week. I look forward to catching up with you soon, okay? You're the best, Sally. Thanks, brother. All right. All right, welcome back to our PFF Wisdom of Solomon podcast with young Anthony Trash. And uh, we're, let's wrap it up by talking about some of the things we saw during the Week 10 season in the National Football League because there were some division leaders who were losers in Week 10. How about this? In the NFC South, the Saints. They came in 7-1 and one and they lost to a 1-7 and seven Atlanta Falcons team. And then in the NFC East, the Cowboys, they're now 1-3 versus teams with a winning record after losing to the Minnesota Vikings. And then in the AFC West, the Chiefs, they fall at home to the Tennessee Titans, and it appears as though they're self-destructing on defense, on special teams. They now have lost four of their last six games. And then the unbeaten San Francisco 49ers lose to Seattle 27-24 in the Monday night game. So we saw carnage in week 10. Four division leaders losing, making the playoff races more interesting. First, let's start with the New Orleans Saints because that was a team that was riding so high. I think they had won six in a row. Um, and then to lose to the Falcons, the one and seven Falcons at home. What caught your eye in that game? And should we be concerned about the Saints? Yeah, I mean, this this game as a whole is just weird. I mean, it, I, if you would have told me this would have happened, I would have said, you're crazy. This not going to happen. Nobody picked the Falcons. Nobody. No, no one. And you would have thought against a bad Falcons defense, mm -hmm. and when you have a good Saints offense, this Saints offense was going to thrive, especially when you have Drew Brees. Yeah. But it was the other way around. You know, this Falcons defense contained the Saints offense, yeah. and then the Saints defense faltered, or you know, kind of played pretty well, actually, against – this Atlanta offense, mm -hmm. which you really wouldn't have expected. And, you know, Drew Brees, he didn't play terribly until the fourth quarter. He had yeah. a 79.9 grade those first three quarters. He just couldn't keep him on the field, right, yeah. on third down. Exactly. And then they came down to the fourth quarter, and he had a 49.6 
great in the fourth quarter, and he really wasn't that aggressive. That, I mean, that's what really stood out to me, yeah. is that he just really wasn't making those big-time throws do, downfield. Do you know why? Because out of nowhere, I know Raheem Morris moved over. He's now running the defense for the Atlanta Falcons. They hit, hurried, and harassed Drew Brees. Six sacks don't even tell the whole story because there were far more pressure on him than just the six sacks. But this goes to show you, you could be the GOAT at quarterback. I mean, the greatest of all time, he is a future Hall of Famer. But if you start to hit any of the quarterbacks, the total production tends to come down. Yeah, and I was I was surprised to see that, especially when you have Ryan Ramchek and Taron Armstead. Great and, offensive line in exactly. New Orleans. And then even Eric McCoy, the rookie, the, that mm-hmm. center, he's been one of our best centers yep. from a grading perspective. So I really wasn't expecting, you know, this Falcons pass rush that's been struggling. I mean, very, very badly poor. That's struggling right. outside of great Jared, of course, you know, to get pressure on the quarterback. And then in that fourth quarter, when it came down, you know, to the meat and potatoes of the game where, you know, it's either boom or bust. You got to make the play now. He had three sacks in the fourth quarter. You know, so this offensive line really didn't help him out a whole lot. And he just really, it doesn't seem like he was risking the ball as further downfield. Yeah. You know, as I mentioned, in that fourth quarter, he had a 5.6 average depth of target. Yeah, that's so unlike Drew Brees. Exactly. And he only had four attempts of 10 or more yards downfield. Wow. He completed just two of them. Isn't that something? Exactly. And, you know, they weren't rushing the ball, clearly. I mean, they only had yeah. one rush attempt in the fourth quarter. So you, you had to expect them to kind of move the ball downfield and try to go, you know, throw it deep. Yeah. And when you have a guy like Michael Thomas, you kind of have to wonder, you know, why not? You know, you're expecting this style of play yeah. from, you know, Teddy Bridgewater, which was successful. That's right. But it can only get you so far. You know, you have to push the ball downfield. Yeah, Drew really Brees, you expect that. And one may argue because the Falcons outrushed the New Orleans Saints 143 to 52 yards on the ground. Um, Latavius Murray, who's been a huge addition for this offense, replacing Mark Ingram, combined with Alvin Kamara, they combined for a total of only 36 yards rushing in the game. And now I look at moments like that, and I say, okay, you're pressuring uh, Drew Brees. So the only way you slow down a good pass rush is you've got to give them some run game. You've got to let the offensive line slow down that pass rush by leaning on them in the run game just to get back to balance on the offensive side because you start throwing and dropping back every single time. The pass rush is pinning their ears back, and they're winning against you. And so I just thought a big, heavy New Orleans Saints offensive line needed to lean on them a little bit more and be more productive in the run game, and they were not able to. And that's where I think the Falcons, that's where their confidence kind of grew. They started getting hits on Breeze, sacks on Breeze, stuff in the run game. And after that, they were like, they were like we got them, boys. <laughs> Raheem Morris, they were over there smiling saying, we got them. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, they're used to just getting that interior pressure mm-hmm. with Grady Jarrett, as I said. But then you have a guy like Adrian Claiborne who walks away with six pressures that's and right. a sack and a hit on Drew Brees. So, I mean, that really has to be a confidence booster. And then you also have Vic Beasley. You know, he didn't win a lot on his reps, but when you pick up two sacks on Drew Brees, I mean, that's going that's to right. light some fire into that Falcons defense. Absolutely. Okay, well, now let's talk about the Dallas Cowboys. We've talked about it. They're now 1-3 against winning uh, teams with a winning record so far this season. And the Vikings just came out on fire. I mean, they jumped out to a 14-0 lead. I thought Dak Prescott played phenomenally well. He and Amari Cooper... They were making plays against uh, those that it was Michael Hughes, of course, who was playing for Xavier Rhodes. He was filling in at the cornerback position. I thought the Dallas Cowboys offensively was clicking, but there were times when they weren't. And then there was time when the defense just weren't making plays. Not enough anyway to come away with a win. Uh, Give kudos to the Vikings, but are you concerned about the Cowboys right now? You know, this was a a big game from them as far as like, you know, the playoff goes. You know, I was... over on our Instagram account, at Pro Football Focus, be sure to give that a follow. That's right. But, you know, we were posting, you know, some of our analysts, you know, mailbag takeaways, mm-hmm. and Sam Monson was up there, and he mentioned a good point from our data scientists, what they brought up, and if they had won, they would have had a 72% chance to make the playoffs. Now wow. that's at 50 because wow. of that loss. So this was a really big game for their playoff It ties chances. them now with the Eagles, right, within their division? Exactly. I mean... You know, you have to look. So now it's between them. I mean, the Giants and the Redskins, I mean, they're out of it. They're done. They're done. That's right. So it's down to these two. But you have to look at, you know, the quarterbacks in his supporting cast around him as to who really has the better chance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at this point, you kind of have to side with the Cowboys because Dak has been playing really well. Phenomenally well. Exactly. And, you know, you kind of have to wonder, you know, we know Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, Lamar Jackson. Those three guys are probably leading the MVP race. That's right. If I had to pick a fourth guy. 
you told me, you sat me down and said, you have to pick a fourth for MVP. You would put Dak? I would put Dak. I mean, he's our seventh highest graded quarterback at 84.7. And when he's kept clean, I mean, he's been phenomenal. You know, fourth in PFF grade, fifth in yards per attempt, and adjusted completion percentage. Yeah. So really what he's doing when he's kept clean and what this receiving unit has done, too. I mean, they're, they're the second highest graded receiving unit. Uh, so far in 2019. By every measure, Dak Prescott outperformed and outplayed Kirk Cousins, who was the quarterback on the winning side of this game. I mean, you had, uh, what, uh, the big-time throws for Dak Prescott. He had four. Kirk Cousins, none. Only one turnover-worthy play for Dak, but he was throwing it a whole lot more. None for Kirk Cousins. He protected the ball very well. Um but three touchdown passes and one interception on to two touchdown passes for Kirk Cousins. Uh, both were only sacked one time. His yards um, per pass attempt um, were much further down the field than that of Kirk Cousins. So he was pushing the ball. He was driving the ball to the outside numbers, um, putting the ball in harm's way because those are dangerous throws. But he had a lot of trust in Amari Cooper. And what about Amari Cooper? What about the game that he played it was as if all night his toes were on right there, just in bounds, as he was making catch after catch for his quarterback, Dak Prescott. Yeah, I mean, that touchdown he had. It was incredible. It. Yeah, it was unreal. I mean, the replay, I still can't believe it. I saw a picture of it again this morning. I, was like, I still can't believe it. I mean, he made PFF's team of the week. I mean, he was yeah. lights out at wide receiver for them. But really, you know, as you said, Dak outperformed Kirk. Mm -hmm. And what really kind of benefited Kirk in this Vikings offense is they picked apart the Cowboys linebackers. I mean, sure badly. Did. And really coming into the season, you would have thought this has been their greatest strength, but it has, it's been kind of declining on them, regressing a lot, a lot more than we would expect with Leighton Vander Esch and Jalen Smith. I mean, Kirk against their linebackers was 14 of 15 for two touchdowns and 140.7 pass rating and a PFF grade of 80.5. Wow, just so, incredible. Yeah, I mean, right? he, he straight up picked apart these linebackers and that's what really kind of Gave him some momentum a little bit, but Dak, you know, ultimately came away the breadwinner of that. So yeah, that that's the only thing that's kind of a tough me. loss. It's a tough loss because he he if your quarterback plays his best and you st it's not enough to win that, as as a team that's just sort of battling for your own division. You, I, you should be worried when you, when your quarterback plays as well as Dak Prescott played. You should win those games I, exactly. And as I said, I mean, that's kind of the only thing that I'm worried about with this Dallas team hmm. is because did this kind of expose their linebackers and our team's going to take advantage of this yeah. more often than what they have been in the past. And the secondary hasn't been the best overall either. But ultimately, like as I said, you know, Dak, I think, can lead them down the road to success. And this offensive line hasn't been playing that well either. Yeah. You know, they're only 11th in pass block grade. And yeah. we would have thought they're they had some energy. That. Exactly. I mean, yeah. this, this is an elite offensive line, and mm -hmm. they can be better. I mean, they're 16th in pressures allowed. And I think they can eventually become. Are, are you worried why Sean Lee is playing a little bit more? Because he's getting matched up in coverage against tight ends. Kyle Rudolph had two touchdown receptions in this game early, and they were against linebackers. And Sean Lee, just he can't run with um, uh, the tight ends. Uh, Leighton Van Der Esch can run with tight ends. Jalen Smith, we expect him to run with tight ends. What are we seeing with this linebacker rotation? And what are you seeing with teams really, once they see Sean Lee is out there, they're looking to get that matchup. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. And I think that's really going to expose them down the road. Mm -hmm. You know, Sean Lee, he played great a few weeks ago. Almost cracked PFF's team of the week, if I recall. Smart, heady player. Exactly. He had a 90.5 PFF grade against the mm -hmm. Giants a few weeks ago. You know, and he's been getting his snaps bumped up more but I think that is cause for concern because yeah. I think more often than not he's going to get he's going to have more bad plays and good plays in coverage and teams will find you you get matched up man-to-man -man coverage and you don't have uh, the speed and the foot quickness to stay with talented tight ends they'll find you um, let's talk about the Chiefs because they have now as I said they've lost four of their last six games they're losing games at home the operation when it comes to field goals, they can't execute it. The defense can't get critical stops. The quarterback is back. Patrick Mahomes throwing for over 400 yards, putting points on the board. Explosive plays are back in Kansas City, and they can't win games. What's going on? What, what are the numbers show? Is it going to get any better? Yeah, I mean, the defense, as I mentioned earlier, it's a liability out there. They're leaking oil. Yeah, they are. And I mean, it's, it's in all phases, pass, rush, run, defense, yeah. coverage. It's, it's been bad. Everywhere. And it's really looking bad 
be just because they got rid of D Ford, who's having success with the 49ers, mm -hmm. and Justin Houston, who is having success Frank with the Frank Clark is not producing. No, he's not. The return on investment is looking bad for them. It's looking like they're going to have to take a loss on this trade they made. And right now they're 28th in pass rush grade. You know, they're, they're generating a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of cleanup pressures as a result of the quarterback giving himself up. So we're really, we're not seeing the job getting done there. They're one of our worst graded run defenses. And granted, you can talk to some people, some analytics guys, and they'll say, you know, run defense doesn't really matter. But when it gets to the point where it's this bad, it does matter. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's been bad for them. Yeah, I mean, you've got to have put up enough fight to be able to get off the field on third down. And late in this game, um, as you know, you could tell, um, as they went into overtime, you could just tell that, uh, this game was not going to be in Kansas City's favor. I remember um, as uh, Tennessee and Tannehill were moving down the field, um, you could just see Patrick Mahomes telling the offensive guys, get ready, get ready. He knew they were going to give up points, and he knew the offense was going to have to go back out there and score points or at least set them up and put them in field goal range, to which he did exactly that, and they could not execute. On the second time they went out to kick a field goal, it was blocked. Um, the first time, they just, I don't know, bad snap, early snap, and then uh, the holder just stood up and just threw the ball, got the intentional grounding, and gave the Titans the ball with great field position. They went down and scored like a hot knife through warm butter. And then here comes Mahomes to put them back in field goal range again, but yet they can't execute the mechanics of kicking a field goal. Yeah, I mean, this was their worst defensive performance overall from yeah. a grading standpoint by far, and as well as in coverage. I mean, their coverage was bad, and they were just getting absolutely beat in coverage by their linebackers and safeties. Yeah. I mean, they were just they were getting picked apart in that area, avoiding the cornerbacks, and they just they kept blowing it. And, yeah. you know, you go back to the season as a whole, and no, no team has more targets against non-wide receivers than the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. There are a lot of uh, opposing offenses are running – personnel packages with two or less wide receivers on the field, you know, and that's really causing, you know, kind of chaos on that defense. And their linebackers and safeties aren't really doing enough to make up for that. Well, anything you want to say about um, the San Francisco 49ers, their division leader that lost in week 10, but we're not worried about them, are we? You know, <laughs> or, is I, there, or is there something you're worried about? Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, I've been I've been a Garoppolo <laughs> truther. I will I will admit it. Okay. Last night he did not he did he not. He looked shaky. Yeah. He looked you know, shaky. And last I checked, you know, grades are still pending review for that game. Okay. As of right now, but his PFF grade it, it was down there for one of the lowest of the. He week. had a lot of turnover worthy plays. Yes. And and that means passes that should have been turnovers where he hit. Seattle defenders right between the numbers. K.J. Wright couldn't catch it. Bobby Wagner, he threw him one. He couldn't catch it. I think there was a couple of more defensive backs who couldn't catch it. He did not protect the ball inside the pocket where he has a couple of fumbles there. I think if I just count off the top of my head before the final grades are in, I think he had six turnover-worthy plays. And I don't remember a lot of big-time throws. No, not at all. I mean, you know, we looked at Emmanuel Sanders, and it looked like early on, you know, yes. you can see that quick pass offense. He's, he really helps his quick pass offense. So I'm, I'm not sure what the MRI said on his rib injury as of lately, but you cannot let this guy, you know, be out of this offense. And especially George Kittle, oh. we saw that. That really hurt him. Yeah, it hurt I mean, him bad. He's, what he's been doing, he might be the best player at his position in 2019. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't have Emmanuel Sanders or George Kittle. You have to be worried. I will say this, because Debo Samuels, Kendrick Bourne, um, Dante Pettis, you got to do a better job for your quarterback. There, there was just way too many drop passes in this game, almost betraying a little bit of Jimmy Garoppolo. So I'm not going to put it all on Jimmy. Jimmy G, you got to do better too, man. Okay, I know you were missing your weapons in George Kittle and Emmanuel Sanders, but you got to do better as well. You got to get a receiver like what I have right here in young Anthony Trash. He catches everything. Nothing gets past him. So if you want more of great content, you can go and you can just subscribe to our YouTube channel just by going to the site at youtube.com slash PFF. You can also go to our site at pff.com if you want more great content. This has been a wonderful time. Don't forget to join us each and every week on the PFF Wisdom of Solomon podcast with young Anthony Tresh. Goodbye, everyone. You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? 
All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.